This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is made possible by 420 friendly service providers in the Gondrepreneur Business Directory. If you need professional help with your business, from accounting to legal services to consulting, marketing, payment processing, or insurance, visit gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to find service providers who specialize in helping cannabis entrepreneurs like you. Visit the Gondrepreneur Business Directory today at gondrepreneur.com slash businesses. Hey there, I'm your host, T.G. Brandfault, and thank you for listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of Gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Uh, today, it's very early morning for him. Uh, I'm joined by Benjamin Jesse. He's uh, the founder of, of the Australian Cannabis Industry Awards, uh, which celebrates the nation's activists, business leaders, and community trailblazers, and uh, they held their inaugural event event uh this year how you doing this uh what 1 a.m for you well it's actually a little bit uh later than that it's 3 a.m here tim but yeah i'm doing really well it's uh it's really nice to connect and i've been a long time listener and it's really good to be on the show well i appreciate that i appreciate that did uh did did, did you wake up for this or did you just not go to sleep uh, i didn't go to sleep yet but, but that's okay <laughs> It's it's a common thing if you're making international calls in Australia, you're sort of not just upside down on the world, you're upside down on the clock too. So so how long uh, have you been sort of uh, in the industry and, and how'd you end up uh, launching the Cannabis Industry Awards, man? What's your background? Yeah, well, I, I first fell in love with cannabis, cannabis about seven or eight years ago now. Um, it's not very long compared to many people in the industry. Um, and it was all it was all the reasons at once to be honest it was uh, quite the conversion i i i have a form of spinal arthritis uh which cbd made a huge difference for but it was also all the other reasons at the same time i um yeah i i loved how it opened my mind and connected the dots of life made me feel a bit more like me you know what it's like um and I guess I guess you call it therapeutic or spiritual benefits um, back seven or eight years ago. And then to top it off, I went in deep learning about you know all the all the eco and sustainable benefits. Um, it's many other medical uses, of course, um, and you know the endocannabinoid system, etc. So yeah, I just learned as much as I could. I really could get my hands on um, about its history and uh, yeah, prohibition and stigma and um the activist community over here and i just yeah i i put my weight behind it all and it was a bit of a no-brainer um to to do the awards as well it's uh, I'm, I'm a passionate kind of person and it was something that had changed my life and i wanted to help it change others as well so yeah so tell me about uh, Australia's cannabis industry. Uh, who's you know who are the major players? Is it is it like the US's where you know you have a lot of small companies because of federal illegalization? You know what's going on? Yeah, well, Australia's cannabis industry um, is, is quite it's quite complicated. It feels a lot, a very similar to the way that the US works. Uh, I mean, the the, the the main players, I guess, uh, in terms of business wise, we've got yeah, we've we've got quite a lot of uh, amazing advocacy groups and public figures pushing for cannabis reforms in Australia. Um, there's about a dozen groups from different segments of the community. I guess it doesn't it doesn't seem quite as strong as the U S as compared to things like normal, uh, that group and so on that I hear about over there, but it's more of a, more of a community push in Australia with large groups of users and compassionate suppliers, such as the, uh, MCUA, which is a medical cannabis users association and the hemp party, hemp uh, standing for help and Mar marijuana prohibition and a few others. Um, yeah, these groups have been around for decades. Uh, they mostly get ignored by politicians and, hassled by police uh but yeah the we've also got uh the, the australian greens party um they've they've shown some pretty effective leadership over here um and pushed for full legalization for a few years now but uh yeah i, I think actually the, the the group which has found the most support and i would say arguably has affected the most change in australia is a group called united in compassion um they're only a few years old uh but they seem to be finding the right balance of like 
organization and action that to, like to be listened to by those in power, I guess. Um, and they really bring together many of the other groups um, who are already existing for years that, you know, with a clear message and, and I guess most importantly, they don't look like hippies. Um, so the politicians actually listen to them, if you know what I mean. Um, but we also have some incredible groups of carers and suppliers that have been on the front lines of cannabis reform, like education, like they're really doing well for educating and saving lives really for decades. And it's these people that the awards are really specifically interested in celebrating, you know, we've, uh, We've, we've actually divided the awards into two main categories, business and community. Um, and the community section, we've, we have awards for the, such as, uh, activist of the year and, you know, um, lifetime achievement award, um, artist of the year, stigma award, uh, women of weed award, education award, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and the business half is probably a little bit more predictable. I guess it's, you know, innovation award, business of the year. Um, packaging of the year, doctor of the year, Colorado of the year, uh, and, and the green award, which is a sustainability award, et cetera. So yeah, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's obviously the, we've had prohibition for the same amount of time in the U S because we pretty much, uh, just took it on board when, when the U S did. So thanks for that. Um, what is, you know, where do patients actually get cannabis, uh, medical cannabis in the country? Is it in pharmacies? Uh, you know, out here we have, you know, dispensaries that are privately owned by and large. Um, you know, what's, what's the process like for patients? Yeah, they are. Well, I mean, I think the best answer to that up until the last few months has been that they don't, uh, they don't get the medicine. Um, unfortunately we, are. Uh, we, a lot of the, the legalization that happened over here was, was, was really strict. The, uh, the laws which had passed and the, the stipulations that cat, that patients had to follow to be able to get medicine was pretty much, oh, and, and the supply as well itself, the actual number of products which were available on the market were, were, were close to zero. You know, we're talking about over the course of a year or two, we had in, in the order of hundreds of patients only. Um, and it was a huge, big, long processes to get, uh, the actual medicine. So, um, until recently, that's, uh, that's been pretty much the way that, uh, it's, it's happened. Unfortunately, uh, as I, as I say, the, the, the legalization has really been very much of a, uh, too strict and too, too controlled. So uh, just to answer the question a little bit more specifically, what happens is it's, um, it, patients need to go to a doctor. They need to get a special. Uh, form and process filled out by the doctor, which is quite um, tedious and hard to do for only a specific number of conditions. And then they get, you know, a, a chosen medicine, which isn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not like they can do their own uh, branded stuff. It's only, it's, there's really only been access to a couple of, a couple of very specifically targeted brands, I guess. So, you know, <laughs> In the uh, reporting that that I that I do do on Australia, it seems to me that the federal government uh, sort of supports research, and there are some bio biopharma companies that are doing some of that research. I, is that a fair characterization? Well, uh, not really. Look, I the, the government's put uh, recently in the last two months put uh, about three million dollars into uh, research. So they've, they've gone, um, for the first time, gone ahead with actually sponsoring specific research into finding the benefits of cannabis. Um, it's, but it's really only a recent phenomenon. There's, there's been a bit of movement recently, but it's, it's mostly be before that, for the last 90 years, it's just been hand waving. They've, uh, they've been claiming that, you know, more research is needed and, um, they've been, they've done that for decades, but really they haven't done anything. Um, it's, 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 it's really been a, what the biggest thing that's holding it up is they don't want to change any laws until there's enough research done. But yeah, which is, it's, it's, it just doesn't make any sense, uh, for, especially when you're talking about just continuing prohibition without actually having any of that support, I guess. 
So it doesn't appear, it doesn't seem to me, you know, from what you're saying, that there's any support for federal uh, legalization, you know, recreationally, uh, despite, you know, the, the budgetary office found that it'd be worth like $2 billion annually for the Australian government. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's actually $3.5 billion annually for the latest data. Um, I'll tell you why as well, Tim. It's, um, it's, it's fascinating. Look, we have a very conservative government in power in Australia, which might be a little bit uh, counter. Um, intuitive for the rest of the world, but we're we're heavily influenced by corporate interest and entrenched lobbyists. It's it's really well known over here. The Conservative government's been in power for six years already, and just in July, um, passed they've won another three years in power, which was actually not expected to happen. But um, most, yeah, yeah. So most people agree that it just seems that they've changed their mind recently because they've really only realised that they can make money off it um, and generate jobs, which looks good in the elections, obviously. It's uh, it's been clear that they don't really care about patients and activists, unfortunately, which, you know, they've been telling them about the medical properties for years. Um, there's, there's been reports from Senate committees and scientists for years telling them all about why they need to decriminalize at least, but they don't budge. Um, so, you know, they, they st actually still trot out all the same reef and madness claims from the 70s. And regularly show how little they know you know they even say like their health minister and things like that will say phrases like smoking the leaf and 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 all of the old you know just really 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 stigmatized ways of seeing cannabis and it's it's a shame that uh, any legalization talk recently by the government has has got to be for the reasons of um that a lot of australia talks about um our government just being corporate based and so on which is it's quite it's quite contrary to the rest of the Australian population, to be honest. And that's not it's it's pretty well accepted as well. We um the Conservative government obviously represents the people because they were voted in. But on the issue of cannabis, um, it's one of those things that they really do not represent the country on. Um, you know, as an example, we we were actually the last country in the world to legalize hemp for food. That was only in two thousand and seventeen. So. Up until then, we weren't allowed to put hemp in any sorts of food at all, and we were the last ones in the world. And it, you know, let alone. And you're not talking CBD. You're talking like no, hemp just seeds? hemp seeds. Yeah, hemp seeds or hemp oil. But yeah, oh, absolutely, it was illegal over here to do that until 2017. So you know, and let alone medical or adult use cannabis. That's how bad the government stigma is about it. Which is, you know, like over over 90 percent of the population in Australia has supported cannabis for more than a decade. Uh, but the government has only really recently passed medical laws, really recently, I mean, and, they, and they've been very strict um, and barely successful. Um, it's, it's it, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we had a bit of state legalization for medicinal cannabis as well, but uh, that's been bogged down and barely useful for access and the number of... And when you say which... Which which state? Yeah, so Melbourne was uh, one of the first ones over here to make uh, quite a bit of progress with that. Um, and there's been there's been there's been local decriminalisation of cannabis as well uh, for certain quantities. So South Australia and a few others had, uh, you know, small levels of decriminalisation and so on. But uh, once again, the, most of the state changes uh, until until very recently have been mostly just on paper, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. What are the what are the penalties for say possessing an ounce? Mm. It's obviously different across the states. Um, I mean, we still have many many people. A large proportion of the prison population is for non-violent drug offences, and eighty percent of those, just like in the states, it's about eighty percent is um, for for possession, like small quantities. We, you know, we're not talking about trafficking and those sorts of things. Um, but in, in New South Wales, for example, which is the most populated state, um, we have a sort of for the last, I think it's about five or so years, we've had sort of a police uh, a three warning system where they, if you were caught with you know small quantities, they would give you warnings before they gave you a criminal record. Um, but that just depends on the police and the time and so on. So it's, it's still very much a criminal offense over here, which I guess is a, 
a bit ironic seeing as we're a uh, convict settlement australia you know we've, <laughs> we're set up by criminals and is, is, is that true i always thought that was like a like a no, legend no that's true yeah it's it's actually very fascinating to him it's uh we yeah we were very much a, a, a convict settlement from the uk um set up originally um and this might shock you but we were set up originally for a few reasons but one of the main reasons was as a hemp colony um, there's, there's quite a lot of history on this, which I've read up on that. Um, it, it shows that uh, we, we really were as a, basically as an outpost somewhere to send all the prisoners, but also to start make, basically, obviously prisoners at the time were slaves. Basically, they, they worked, they produced, they, they, they built half of the things in Australia back in the day. And um, they, they essentially used them to create huge big hemp, hemp crops to uh, make ropes and, and uh, fiber and different th you know for fabrics and so on so it was yeah it's quite <laughs> it's quite an ironic story well i mean this is very this is very fascinating in the sense that like if you look back on sort of uh, american history as well and then you had mentioned sort of the you know uh, the the brief parallel between or at least the the u.s export of uh, prohibition but yeah uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson famously uh, had a hemp farm. The Declaration yeah, of yeah. Independence is is famously written on hemp paper. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we get the 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 sort of prohibition, and and now, I mean, now it seems to me that I mean we're. I mean, we're a bit more progressive in terms of sort of this, the, the federalist uh, system. I mean, it, like so, because we the states can basically do what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it seems like like that sort of happens in in Australia as well. It does. It does. It happens for most things. So we 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 definitely have the state based um, laws for a lot of things. Although it's not it's not strictly adhered to that often. I mean, it depends on the issue. But the states just mostly are pretty well agreed across across most of the. Um, bigger issues, I guess. We don't we don't have as wide, it seems, a variety of uh, state based laws. I suppose we are, we're, we're a very cohesive country. You know, like we do have the disparities across a few of the further states. You know, one state might be a little bit more conservative than the other, but we we tend to sort of have very similar federal laws, I guess. I mean, recently, I mean, we can, we can talk about the, the, the capital territory where they had uh, basically allowed, I think it's, you know, what is it, two plants or something, uh, in a, a city, like people who, residents there could grow a couple of plants, uh, decriminalization uh, yeah. of, of possession. Um, and then the attorney general comes out and basically says, you know, this law doesn't have any effect because yeah. of Commonwealth laws. Yeah. Um, the feds at large, though, say that they're not going to challenge it. Um, so, so, you know, what can, can you sort of provide a little clearer picture of what happened or will happen in the ACT and, and, uh, what the response do you think will probably be? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the state, so the ACT, the Australian capital territory, it's sort of like your Washington DC, I guess. Um, and yeah, they, they, they have only literally just passed the first adult use laws in Australia, um, you know, for 90 years. Um, it allows you, as you say, to two plants and 50 grams of flour um and st there's still no sales allowed or gifting or anything like that um but yeah the the legalization of the act has really been exciting for all the cannabis supporters in australia uh, although australia like the act itself has less than two percent of the population um it's very symbolic you know it, it could be it could be a big symbolic move going forward it, it, could, you, the ACT could well just be the guinea pig for some of the other states to follow, particularly Victoria and South Australia, um, which would probably be next. And they're about 35% of Australia's population. Um, and considering we're, considering we do have a very conservative government in power for at least three more years, um, you know, state legal, legalization may be the way it happens. Uh, and there's a lot of people will tip that. It just depends on the next government after this three years, I suppose. And the federal the federal government has threatened to overturn um, the change in the law. It's they're sending mixed messages though. So whilst you say they won't, they won't challenge it. They they still are threatening um, to change it before it becomes legal in January. But it's just hard to tell if they're just making some noise to be seen. You know, um, they they seem to be threatening at the moment. But the state government's actually threatening them back and saying, "Don't you dare change it," um, and you can't change it, and those sorts of things. And the federal government has actually overridden state laws in the past, um, such as abortion and gay marriage. Um, so it's not out of the question. Definitely not out of the question. 
I guess we just have to wait and see really until January. If, if it ticks over in January and nothing's happened, then, you know, that'll, that'll be exciting. And it's, it's really exciting nonetheless. Um, it's just one of those necessary steps in legalization, I guess. And if it gets overturned, fine, you know, it's, it, it's going to, but it will cause such a fuss and it will, it'll, it'll be the catalyst for a lot of other things. So I get, you know, we'll see how it goes, but I guess we've just got to wait and see really. Um, so, so here, I mean, the U S I'm sure, you know, everyone knows how our stupid political system works, but it's, it's a two party system, essentially, uh, one, a one party system, if you will. Um, and, and the Democrats, they give lip service to, uh, sort of, you know, oh, we're gonna, you know, we would legalize, I mean, Bernie Sanders, for example, right. He's been on the campaign trail lately, just saying, you know, I'll legalize within a hundred days. Is there a candidate or anybody in Australia who uh, could rise to sort of a position of federal power that has, uh, that sort of, uh, advocacy for cannabis, or is that completely not on anyone's radar? Federal? No, uh, not really like that no so the system over here is a little bit different we, we we're still the two-party system so we've got the um, conservative and liberal um it's actually a bit strange because over here our liberal party is actually the conservative party <laughs> um so strange. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to discuss it from for, with overseas people and because we sort of we've lost the meaning of the word liberal over here it means conservative so i won't use that word i'll just describe it another way but yeah our our conservative party is basically a absolute no go on legalization. As I say, they talk about the um, the reefer madness stuff. That and the, the other party, the the more liberal party, <laughs> um, uh, as as you'd call the Democrats, I suppose they they are more supportive of it. And there has been mention um, prior to this legalization that they want to support it more. But it's nothing like the Bernie Sanders or um, a couple of your other candidates that who, who, if they do actually get the nomination would change everything. The, the closest that I think we have is our Greens party, which, um, the, the way our, our system works is that if, if it's a, if the votes pretty even and they have a balance of power and they need to make a deal with the, with the government at the time, they can put forward things and they do, they put a lot of pressure on things like cannabis legalization if they get that that um you know the third say on things but that that's a that's usually just a concession it's not so much a, a chance of being in power so often you know people would say oh we might still be another two or three governments away from federal legalization just because it's you know we don't have a leader who who would say anything like that at the moment unfortunately and who, who does the U.S. like a, a policy affect Australian policy, or is there another sort of, uh, you know, is it is it is it uh, the U.K. Uh, you know, or or you know, because you had said that that we you know the U.S. sort of gave you guys prohibition. Is it still sort of you know if if the U.S. were to legalize, for example, would that sort of maybe nudge the feds in the right direction, or the U or or U.K. for example, which is even less likely yeah personally i think so i think if the us or the even you know even the narcotics act and so on i think we we tend to look up to the big brothers here in australia you know like if something happens overseas we do tend to give it a a, a lot of um influence but at the same time having said that i mean you've you've handed over the stigma as well as the prohibition if you know what i mean so the people yeah. the people especially those who have been you know trotting out the same message for so long to believe their own message about all of the stigma of it so it, it's it's one of those it's one of those problems that exists regardless just because people are so stigmatized by it which which is quite funny when you know a bit more about australian culture um to be honest because we uh, like especially when you're talking about um alcohol um in australia um <laughs> It's 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 a it's a very funny dichotomy if you compare the two because we have such a strong alcohol culture in Australia. It's actually it's um it's almost a rite of passage for our prime ministers to be seen drinking a beer at the footy, with the football, um and and at local pubs and with everyday Aussies. Like it really is. It's a, it's a photo opportunity that happens every single time a new prime minister comes in. And in fact, it's. <laughs> one of our most popular prime ministers um may maybe one of maybe the most popular prime minister bob hawk um he set a world record for sculling 2.5 pints of beer in 11 second seconds and he uh he, like he, there's even a brewing co brewing company named after him and a very popular lager the bob hawk lager yeah um it's quite it's quite remarkable compared to the cannabis industry and 
it's funny because like Bob Hawke himself said in his memoirs that he thinks it's the, the single biggest reason for his political success, the, the fact that he skulls um, a beer at the football. And it's every time he goes to the football now, like the, all the crowd around him chants and cheers for him to skull a football. And, you know, and we know that, that alcohol is killing 6,000 people in Australia every year um, from alcohol-related diseases and poisoning. And yet when it comes to... You know, the far less dangerous substance, cannabis, it, which has never killed a single person. The government is so superstitious and afraid. Um, many, you know, many, many people refer to the Australian government as a nanny state. Um, if you've heard the phrase before, because we, we have a very overbearing and protective government from, from like, from media sponsor, uh, censorship laws to lockout public drinking laws to um, police power laws to protester laws all sorts it's no wonder they have like a blanket nanny state prohibition still on it um your listeners probably aren't probably unaware or didn't hear about the last month of the newspapers in australia they um all of the newspapers like all of the newspapers in australia published the same front page which was just a completely blacked out page with the small text saying that australia's government is hiding and censoring information from the public that it's important to know um and they and they can't legally talk about it, and that's not just one topic; it's dozens, you know, dozens of different topics. Then they're, they're, they're barred from talking oh, about. Shit. Yeah, it's it's a big it's a big deal, and that and that carries across as well, you know, um, to the same sort of nanny state that we get for other other bits and pieces. We're very heavily controlled, you know, whistleblowers and activists, and they're all treated very harsh. And it's no it's no wonder that we have you know these this enemy set up of of um cannabis it's it, it really fills that role well for them so i mean it it sounds like you know the the the, the chance to sort of put together this awards is i mean it's I mean, it didn't strike me at first like activism, but in a sense, when you live under this sort of, you know, you know I mean, it, it's, it's even more, it sounds a little more oppressive than uh, the U.S. government, which I have my own sort of, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, no, uh, I know, issues I know with. You, I know uh, you'd be, if you, if you found out more about the Australian government, Tim, I know that you would be uh, on the side of, of pulling your hair out at least, that's for sure. So, so I mean, did you was, was that sort of one of the things you were trying to do at the time was to was to sort of bring it, uh, you know, uh, above the whispers? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. Look, it's it's definitely one of the main motivators of the awards itself. I mean, we, I guess, it's probably a bit easier to answer the question just to go back of why we I originally and why the group of uh, friends that I started it with actually did start it. Um, look, you know, we, uh, my, my history with cannabis has, when I first learned about it, as I mentioned at the start, I, I sort of wanted to help out the cause and, and bring attention and awareness to it. I created um, those videos, um, educational videos, and I, I you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking, well, you know, what else can I do? How, how can I, how can I make the stigma less and how can I support the industry? Um, and bring a bit more, sorry, excuse me, attention to some of the activists and the businesses who, and the businesses over in Australia who are doing the right thing and who are being oppressed and so on. And it, and it was one of those uh, thoughts of, well, hang on, you know, a, a legitimate industry, every legitimate industry needs a needs a, a an award ceremony. And, and not only that, but it's also um, about bringing the recognition, I guess, um, to, of, of, um, companies and, and activists in, in the, in, in, to the public, you know, to show them that we're, we really are trying to, um, make this much more, uh, above ground and spoken about, you know, we're going from the black market to the supermarket and people need to have a, 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 a Place where the community is represented and, and celebrated and, and encouraged to uh, to have good business practices and to be you know all of those things. So yeah, absolutely. Can you tell me about some of the challenges that uh, you sort of uh, faced when you you know were putting this whole thing together? Yeah, challenges. Uh, look, it wasn't a challenge to get the industry on board. That's for sure. Um, you know, we, we have, we have such a good culture behind it that it was, it's very well supported. 
Um, I think, I think we, you know, as, as the rest of the world has this can of ban um, on advertising and so on, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is that we, we, we can't advertise it anywhere. We can't publish these things. We can't put it on Facebook or Instagram or Google. Um, and we especially can't put it in, um, you know, newspapers and those sorts of things. So it, 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 one of the biggest challenges is actually connecting to people and getting out to people and, and getting people aware of, the whole thing it's very siloed people are sort of and i mean that's a that's a key strategy of criminalization and prohibition i guess it separates you know divides and conquers it makes everyone not be able to communicate about it and to see what else other people are doing and so on so awareness often is that big linchpin of making a change in things realizing that others as well are out there and that you know it's doing good for so many people and so on and that really changes minds um, especially when it comes to the cannabis industry. So what's 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 your next step, man? Like, what what, uh, what are you gonna have like coming up? Like, like you know, what what's next for the awards? Yeah, well, uh, we as I said, we we've we've got a lot of our supporters telling us that they want to have like a gala, um, like a, a an actual award ceremony thing, which we didn't do this year, um, just because it was our first year. We don't have any sponsors or anything like that, but we will be getting those on. Um, yeah, we've got we've got quite a few um, plans for the coming years. I mean, it's still very obviously early on in the industry, and we're we're still finding our feet and designing the systems and so on. But um, we we've put a lot of effort into making the awards not uh, to be built properly and to have the the right structure and so on. We want to make sure that we have that credibility and and that we really have everyone on board and we don't you know. We don't have to get into any of the politics of uh, the differences of opinion that might exist in the cannabis industry and so on. And and a lot of that is around making sure that, um, for example, our, uh, our the way that we do the, the, the judging of the awards, of the nominations, is actually a, an independent panel um, of, of industry leaders and people who have been activists or business leaders in the space for a long time. And they and we, we get them to actually vote through our our, our transparent and proprietary system that we've made specifically so that it can be not just us choosing awards, if you know what I mean. Like it's not just the, the, the uh, us choosing who we think wants to be the, the award winners and also trying to avoid the, the pitfalls of having just chosen by the public as well, which can be a problem. You know, obviously that, that tends to lead to only the big companies with the big followings getting the, the awards because they can afford to get more people voting on um, a, a thing, a, on a product or whatever. So th this this way, it really is some of the biggest names and the most well-respected names in the industry who are judging and um, so on. And we've, and we've been really lucky to have, I think it's about 13 or 14 judges at the moment. And we sort of, we'll go through the process of cycling through those over the years and um, making sure that it's, it's well representative of both the business and community sides. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, and then you you had mentioned that you couldn't you know really advertise. So how did you did you spread the word about this? Mm, it's, it's it it really does speak to the the grassroots of it all. I guess it does. It it really shows that you know people are more than happy to um, talk about it and to and and to share the information. And I guess I saw on like we've we've just been siloed and picked on by government and police for so long that we you know everything that's in the industry that's good people will will help share and really will talk about and um it's and as i said at the start it's really validating to know that everyone agrees that we need it and that this is filling that space um in more than one way uh for for yeah for the industry uh, so where can people find out more about the awards? Where can they find uh, out more about you, man? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, look, Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, two good spots, although, and you'll just find us through Cannabis Industry Awards. Um, just find the one, the Australian one, because um, there are a few other awards around the world. But the best way really is, as I say, to because of the fact that we might get our Instagram or Facebook shut down is to actually join our mailing list. So we're, our website is uh, cannabisawards.com.au, which is the AU for Australia. That's the name, domain name that we're use, using over here. Um, and yeah, all the info is on the, on the website. It's, um, we, we put a lot of effort and a lot of thought into making sure that we're, you know, we're communicating with the right people to get their feedback. And we're, we're keen to hear from anyone about, 
their you know advice of how they would like things to run or or ideas that we can do and so on um and yeah people can just do that and just sign up to our mailing list it's, it's the best way really on on the website at cannabiswars.au or you can find me as well on linkedin um i'm benjamin jesse um on linkedin happy to connect with anyone Excellent, man. Look, I really appreciate you taking the, you know, not going to sleep, uh, stand up super late to do this. Um, you know, and, and I'm excited to see, you know, how, how next year goes for you. And, and you know, I, I'm always interested in, in seeing, you know, global policy. And, and so um, I'll, I'll definitely have my eye on uh, the, the quote, liberal government, unquote, yeah. and see if there's any, uh, any movement there, man. I appreciate your time. Not a problem. Yeah, it was fantastic to talk to you, Tim. Thanks so much for uh, giving us the space. You're very welcome. You can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you'll find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, T.G. Brandt. Thank you.